There's uh, some seats down front if, if anybody's looking for a seat. All right, let, let's get started. Uh, thank you all for coming out on this uh, beautiful summer evening, even though it's almost fall. Uh, uh, we appreciate your attendance of these. Uh, these are becoming quite popular, and we're very pleased that that's the case. Uh, we're happy to see the enthusiasm for science in our community, and we hope to be able to, uh, to show you some of the newest stuff that's coming out of uh, our institution. I'm Rick Carlson. I'm the director of the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism, which is one of two. Uh, re it is. Yeah. I'm not speaking close enough, I think. Uh, uh, one of the two departments of the Carnegie uh, Institution for Science that's in, in, uh, in Washington. There's uh, two departments of ours in the Stanford campus, one in Pasadena that also runs telescopes down in Chile, and there's a department of embryology in, uh, up in uh, John Hopkins campus in Baltimore. So we're the, we're the local Washington campus, the only ones really fitting the, the old name of our institution, which was Carnegie Institution of Washington. Uh, we do a wide variety of work here, a very multidisciplinary group of people that do everything from planetary science to uh, basic earth science, geophysics, studying volcanoes, uh, a, a whole range of material. So today we have uh, a pleasure in particular of, of uh, hearing from Alan Boss. Alan Boss has been a staff member at, at uh, DTM for 38. 38 years. So I, I think I'm the only member of the department that, that preceded you here. Yep, so we're, yep. we're pretty close. Uh, got his degrees at the University of California at Santa Barbara uh, in, in physics, uh, and then came uh, to us not long afterwards. He's an incredibly pro prolific researcher. He has uh, over 300 papers and 10 books, uh, popular science books, which are well worth the read. Uh, one of them goes by a title very similar to the, uh, tonight's talk, Universal Life, The Search for Life Beyond the Solar System. Alan is a, a theoretician who does astrophysical modeling of the way that uh, planets and, and stars form, uh, but lately he's taken up as well uh, astronomical observing, and he's uh, actually uh, in the process of detecting exoplanets. Uh, and that's a part of the subject that he'll cover today on his talk, Universal Life, Search for Life Beyond the Solar System. Thank you. Thank you all for coming again. Let me repeat, uh, Rick's welcome to you all. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about tonight is basically uh, the search for life beyond our solar system. And by that, I really mean looking for another Earth-like planet. We know of only one planet for sure that has life, our own Earth. And so uh, not being all that inventive, we think, well, maybe we'll find another Earth. There might be life there, too. Uh, of course, we'll be looking for life in other sorts of environments. But for a zeroth order search, we should at least be able to find another Earth. So the question you might ask is, uh, you know, philosophers have been talking about uh, the possibility of life on other planets for, for hundreds of years. It's not a new idea. And uh, we have wonderful telescopes. We're used to having the Hubble Space Telescope take gorgeous images of all sorts of things. Why didn't the Hubble Space Telescope just go out and snap a picture of a, of a nearby Earth-like world? After all, Hubble has a great power. It can take pictures of very faint galaxies, so-called 25th magnitude galaxies. And a 25th magnitude galaxy is just about the same brightness as Earth would be if viewed from a nearby star. So Hubble could just take a picture of an Earth for us. No big deal, right? The problem is that that very faint 25th magnitude object is right next to its host star. And so that's why we uh, have such a hard time actually finding planets, which is illustrated in this slide. I will not show you very many graphs like this, but just to show you what's going on. Uh, here is the light from the sun as a function of wavelength. These are visual wavelengths here where the sun is brightest. And this is going out to infrared wavelengths, 10 microns, like a, like a heat lamp. And at uh, visual wavelengths, the Earth just is shining by reflected light from the sun. So it's just the same stellar sun spectrum, but dropped down by a large factor because Earth is small and it's pretty far from the sun. And it's that drop in brightness there that it's a factor of 10 to the 10th, or 10 billion. So Earth is 10 billion times fainter than the sun. That's why it's so hard to see Earth next to something 10, time, 10 billion times fainter shining right in your eye. Things improve a little bit at infrared wavelengths because the planets give off their own thermal emission. And so those are attractive ways to look for Earth-like planets too. But unfortunately, if you want to image one at longer wavelengths, you have to make your telescope proportionately larger. So if you want to work at 10 microns instead of one micron, you have to make your telescope 10 times larger. You can imagine that presents certain problems. As a result, a lot of the detections, in fact, the very first ones, have been found not directly by just taking a picture, so-called direct imaging. They've been found indirectly. 
And the indirect methods all rely on something that we learned in elementary school, which is not quite right. We're told that planets orbit around the sun. It's not true. The planets and the sun orbit around the center of mass of the system. This is a highly uh, idealized picture showing a planet which is uh, pretty massive compared to its star. In the case of Jupiter going around our sun, Jupiter is a thousand times less massive than the sun, which means that the center of mass of that system, the sun-Jupiter system, is a thousand times closer to the sun, which means in reality the sun actually orbits around a circle which is only equal to its own diameter. So if you can see the sun from afar in, in a fixed frame, frame, you can see the sun go around its own diameter, very small angle, once every 12 years, the same time it takes Jupiter to go around. So the key is that uh, while Jupiter is running around here in a 12-year period, the sun's got to make this one orbit of its own diameter in 12 years, which means it's moving on average at 13 meters per second, 30 miles per hour. So the question is, can you detect this Doppler shift of the sun? Or if someone's looking on a, at our system from another, another nearby star, can you watch the sun modulate its velocity with respect to you by plus or minus 30 miles per hour. Well, if you've driven by the speed cameras on Connecticut Avenue, you know that it's not that hard to measure 30 mile per hour shifts in velocity. <laughs> uh, I have uh, my own ex uh, experience for that. Uh, but the problem is the Doppler shift is actually measured with respect to the speed of light. So you take that 30 miles per hour and the shift in wavelength, you divide that by the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, and you get a rather tiny number, a number which is a few parts in 100 million. And that works out to be on a Doppler spectrometer, which tries to measure that wavelength shift to only about a, 100 or so silicon atoms. So you're looking for a shift in some spectral feature on a detector in a big telescope that's only moving back and forth by a very tiny amount. So it's not easy to do, but various folks have been working on it for, for several decades. And up until 1995, they'd not really found anything that was publishable. But in 95, everything broke loose when two Swiss astronomers, Michel Mayor and Didier Kahlo, published this plot of 51 peg B. 51 peg B is the planet, 51 peg is the star. 51 peg is a very typical solar type star. Uh, and they had developed a new spectrometer and used it at an observatory in the, in the Hall Provence Observatory in southern France and measured this very nice periodic change of the velocity of 51 peg with respect to their observatory. Uh, and the nice thing about it is it's a nice smooth sine curve, which means that it's, this planet is on a circular orbit, just like Jupiter is pretty much around our sun. And the amplitude is a nice big, uh, you can see it's a pretty clear signal, a few spurious data points here and there, but this amplitude corresponds to a planet with a mass one half the mass of Jupiter. Sounds nice, found a half Jupiter mass object, circular orbit. The only surprise about this was the orbital period was not 12 years like Jupiter, it was 4.23 days. That was a real stunner. But this, this is the first confirmable planet, which I'll show you in a moment. And it was really was, this was the birth of the entire field of exoplanets. And if these two are the parents, I consider myself a midwife of sorts because I was a referee on the Nature paper. <laughs> Basking in the reflected glory of 51 Peg B. But the really great thing about a four-day orbital period is that it only takes four days to confirm it or deny it. So when they announced this at a meeting in Florence, Italy in October, uh, and the press got a hold of it, it was actually in the Washington Post, and I, I think it was even on the front page maybe, but below the fold, uh, my colleague Paul Butler uh, and his colleague Jeff Marcy had been doing radio velocity searches as well uh, using the Shane Telescope on Mount Hamilton by San Jose, and they rushed to the telescope, and they took a couple of four nights of observations, and this actually shows a number of other observations, but they were able to confirm one week later the fact that this planet was real. That's the first time that happened. Now, you'll notice this is kind of a scratchy old, crummy looking PowerPoint image because I took it from an old slide that I got long ago from Paul Butler. And it sort of shows you the level of investment they had in their project. That was the best audiovisual material he had to give me to represent in his talks because they were running this on a shoestring. They had no money. No one really thought that you're going to find any exoplanets, so don't give them any money. But I love, I love that, that image, and I treasure that slide, because to me, it's like having a Babe Ruth rookie card. You know? this, is, this, is, this is the beginning of it all. So because of the surprise of, oh my god, there are Jupiter mass planets with very short period orbits, Paul Butler decided, well, gee, we've been taking data for eight years now. 
we haven't really analyzed it. Maybe we should look to see if we have some short period orbits in there. They're looking for 12-year orbital periods. So they figured, let's wait till we take 12 years of data, then we'll look to see what's there. So he went back to Berkeley or in San Francisco State and uh, crunched through the data. And by January of the next uh, year, they gave a talk at the AAS meeting in, in, uh, in Austin uh, and uh, sorry, San Antonio, Texas, and announced two more planets, which led to this breathless cover on Time Magazine. Two planets brings us closer to solving the most profound mystery in the cosmos. This is just less than 25 years ago. But if you look at the political banner in the corner, it seems like a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, for you young people in the audience, that's not Liddy Dole and Hillary Clinton. Those are their spouses who were battling it out back in 1996. <laughs> so that is truly when the field took off. So the Doppler radial velocity technique became a, a, a standard routine way for finding exoplanets. And they basically used Doppler to discover the first 100 or so planets. And so here's what the field looked like as of about uh, 2010, about nine years or so ago, showing you the masses of the objects and Earth masses. So uh, one Jupiter, here's one Earth, one, uh, th about 318 Earth masses. Here's Earth, Venus. And showing you their distances from the star and orbits in uh, units of an AU, which is the astronomical unit, distance of the Earth from the sun, 93 million miles. So there are a lot of uh, these hot Jupiters, like 51 Peg. It's in so close, it's very close to a star. It's heated a lot. Lots of hot Jupiters were found. Lots of cold Jupiters or warm Jupiters, and even some few direct imaging, I'll show you later, uh, some really cold Jupiters out here. And the fact that there wasn't much of anything down in this area is because the radial velocity technique is biased to finding things in the, in the, in the direction of, towards the upper left. So as you get down in this area, they just can't find it because they don't have enough uh, resolution with their spectrometer. But there are a few low mass planets found, found around M dwarf stars where it's a little bit easier to find them. And so there are a few exceptions to that rule of, of these are mostly solar type stars. But this is what we're really, really looking for, of course, the so-called habitable zone of, of roughly Earth mass planets. Nothing much there, although there's some hints that there should be something down there. So at that point, we sort of realized, and we've known for some time, that we may need some other techniques for finding Earth-like planets. And so the other indirect technique that's become extraordinarily successful is based on transits. The fact that if you happen to be looking at a planet which has its orbit aligned with the center of the star so that you, uh, the planet passes in front of the star as it orbits around periodically, there's a transit going on. When it go passes behind, that's called an eclipse. And these uh, actually occur actually quite uh, frequently on our own solar system. Here, for example, is a photo uh, taken by a, an amateur astronomer from Northern Virginia who loaned me this long ago of Venus crossing the sun. Uh, and so uh, Venus is quite small compared to the sun. Uh, it's about 100, about 100 times smaller in diameter. So that means that the amount of light it's blocking is proportional to its area. Its area being 100 times smaller is 10,000 times smaller area. So it means you're only blocking one part in 10,000 of the light. You can't really measure that small of a dip from the ground. At best, you can do maybe a 1% drop in light. In fact, one of the with the time we had found 10 hot Jupiters, the 10th one was found to transit its star. Because it, a Jupiter is 10 times larger, so it only drops the light from the star by 1%. And that you can do uh, from the ground. In fact, uh, HD 209458b was found in transit, the first transiting planet, by a couple of scientists using a four-inch telescope in a parking lot in Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> so if you knew when to, where to look and when to look, it's not that hard. But if you want to... If you want to see something as small as an Earth-sized planet, you have to go to space. So Bill Brookie, who was working on these ideas when I was a postdoc at NASA Ames in the, in, the, in the late 70s, he was already beginning the concept for flying a specialized space telescope that would just star, stare at hundreds of thousands of stars and with a very precise camera, follow the light curves of, of hundreds of thousands of stars and wait for those little tiny dips, one part in 10,000, that in, indicate that there's an Earth-like planet there. Uh, he had a long battle uh, getting this thing funded. It took, I think, five or six proposal cycles before it was finally funded, but it was indeed funded and built and launched. 2009, I think it cost a total of uh, $600 million when they're all said and done. So it delivered some really what I would call flagship quality science at, at a much lower cost mission. So Kepler is a grand success for this field. So Kepler spent four years staring at the same field in the constellation Cygnus and Lyra. Here's a picture of the galactic plane. 
They wanted to be close to the galactic plane because the stars kind of crowd around the plane, but didn't want to be in the plane because it's a little bit too crowded. And so you can see there are a number of detectors there spread out on the sky. Kepler had essentially a 10 degree by 10 degree square field of view and just sat there staring, unblinking, <laughs> kind of like the guy in Clockwork Orange, right, who can't close his eyes. Uh, for, for four years, it had, it had one uh, dust cover that was blown off once it was, got in orbit, and thereafter it could never close its eyes. Stared for four years, and uh, that's the sort of time scale you need. If you want to find an Earth-like planet, which has sort of a one-year orbital period, you want to see it repeat itself. So you better watch for four years so you can actually see three transits occur and, and say, yeah, I think it's real. So the one of the first things they did to try to calibrate the instrument once Kepler was launched was look at a, a, a rather large um, hot Jupiter, uh, which had been found from the ground. This is actually ground-based detection like the one I told you about before. And so it's only, a, it's like a 1% dip, but you can see Kepler was able to follow this transit over and over again with, with really high precision. And not only that, it could see the eclipse on the back side. So here is a blow up in essence of this and showing the two transit dips. And then in the back side, you're seeing the brightening because you're starting to see the front, of the, the front side of the planet coming around the star and then it suddenly drops behind the star and it drips, drops down in the eclipse. And then you see the front side of the planet again, the sun say, facing side. So actually here, this light here, if you say this is the star light down here and everything above that is the planet. So it was able to confirm that planet right away. And within the first five, uh, 43 days of, of taking data, here's that same sort of discovery space chart I showed you before. They are added five new hot Jupiters. Not hard at all, because these are short period orbits. By then they had seen uh, you know, four, five, six transits of each of these objects. You can be really sure if you co-add co -add the data, you really do see the, uh, a dip. But of course, Kepler really wasn't looking for hot Jupiters. That's not the point. It's looking for Earths. So it took the whole four years of the, of the mission, when unfortunately it had to be truncated because of uh, some mechanical problems with the reaction wheels that allow you to point the spacecraft precisely and hold it staring at that one part of the sky. But within a couple, uh, but that, so it finished up in 2013, but then they spent several years refining their data pipeline. So the last big data release was in June of 2017. Here's the sort of same sort of discovery space, only now in terms of period and basically giving you the size rather than the mass because Kepler doesn't determine the mass directly. All you're doing is seeing the size of how much of the star was blotted out. And if you know the size of the star, then you can say the size of the planet. But we can, we can sort of guess that uh, uh, if you're somewhere around this size here of Earth, then you're probably close to Earth mass, although there are some variations on that that I won't go into in this talk. So here was the previously known, and then the, this most, release, most recent data release was all the yellow dots. And the really surprising thing about this was that we knew the hot Jupiters were there and we're hoping to see something down here. The theorists who predicted this area here should be pretty empty because in the conventional way of making Jupiter planets is you start off with a, say a 10 Earth mass core, it gets a lot of mass, it goes up here, becomes a Jupiter. Instead, we found this huge number of what we call super Earths, uh, which was totally theoretically not predicted. It's a wonderful thing because here again is a cutoff to the observational bias, but you can see as you drop down, it looks like we're finding more and more and more planets. So even though there are only a few out here, like at, at earth size uh, orbital zones where it's habitable, we have liquid water, there are a number of lower mass stars that also have habitable planets. And so if you summarize all the ones that are thought to be in the habitable zone for all the Kepler mission, uh, you get actually a fair number of, of objects around not only uh, stars like the sun with surface temperatures of 5,800 Kelvin, but also around so-called M dwarfs and some K dwarfs, lower mass stars. And then the real question is, well, we have observational biases. We weren't really able to observe as long as we want to. And so a number of, of different groups have tried to estimate what the observ observational bias is and make a corrections for, well, what is the true number? Given what we, the things we can see and not see, what is the true number? And the most astounding thing of all, and this is, this, is the, this is the money shot for this entire talk, is right there. The estimate is that the frequency of Earth-like planets is close to one. I have to stop for a while because I get choked up when I say that. So that means when you look out at the sky at night, practically every star you look at has an Earth. We didn't know that before Kepler. It's stunning. 
That's why I called the book Universal Life. They're everywhere, they're everywhere. I'm not being exaggerating, that is really amazing. But that just means they're kind of earth size and they have liquid water on, on their surface, but do they have life? Next step is, are they, they are, they're potentially habitable, but are they actually inhabited? Is there something there? In order to learn that, we've got to figure out something out about how life forms. So we go to Campbell's Soup. <laughs> and uh, basic feeling is if you have a planet with, with water and rocks and microbes uh, should, be, should be starting to come together in them and forming themselves. I won't uh, read the details here, but if you have the basic ingredients, uh, you know, carbon, hydrogen, uh, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and you should be able to make some amino acids and get, get life started. So uh, the way to determine, though, if a planet really has life started is to look at its spectrum. So that's why we want to be able to take direct imaging pictures of planets and study their spectrum. And it's been done for a number of hot Jupiters. So we've already been able to find uh, uh, all four of the primary biomarkers. The ba basic biomarkers for finding life are, first of all, carbon dioxide. Earth, Venus, and, Mer and Mars all have carbon dioxide. We want to have water, because we still believe water-based chemistry is the most likely to be able to support life, at least certainly life similar to our own. Not shown on this slide, but we also want to see evidence for methane. Methane on Earth is produced by a number of sources, primarily methanogenic bacteria, which live in swamp water. They also live in the gut of ruminants. So believe it or not, something like one-third of the methane that the U.S. emits comes from cows and sheep and goats. So if you find a plant that has methane on it, you might say, well, they probably have some methanogenic bacteria, and maybe they have a few dairy cows as well, which <laughs> makes it even more interesting place to visit. And then the fourth biomarker is oxygen. So it could be either oxygen or ozone, depending on which wavelength band you're looking at. But oxygen basically comes from a, a growth of single-cell uh, creatures, the cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. They begin to show up in the fossil record about two billion years ago and roughly 500 million years or so ago during the Cambrian explosion with multicellular life. Uh, Plant-based uh, life uh, began cranking out oxygen and today we worry about the Amazon basin because again the plant life in the Amazon basin produces a lot of oxygen for us. So those are the four biomarkers you want to look for. And it's not that hard to measure them in the Earth's atmosphere. I'm just showing you here a mid-infrared plot, which is actually taken by a NASA spacecraft, which is on its way to, to Mars at the time. It went back and took a picture of the Earth. And this is at mid-infrared wavelength. So now wavelength <coughs> increases to the left. Here's 10 microns and 50 microns. But as you can see, the uh, Earth's spectrum, which is fitted sort of roughly by 270-degree Kelvin black body, has nice absorption features due to water, feature due to ozone, Features due to carbon dioxide. And if you go back to shorter wavelengths, there are features due to methane and oxygen and so on. So that's the hope, is to eventually find it for an Earth-like planet. We've done it for hot Jupiters. We know it can be done. We've done it for the Earth. Now we want to do it for some super-Earths. In fact, some of you may have noticed there was some press the last couple of days about a claim for detection of water on a planet called uh, K218. K2 means it was discovered by the Kepler-2 mission, which is the follow-on to Kepler after Kepler's reaction wheel failed. They figured it had a clever way to keep it working. And the K2 mission managed to find more planets. And they found a planet with a mass of about uh, nine times the mass of Earth. And there, there are two different papers who are both sort of released their results on the same day because they're clearly competing for a Nobel Prize or something or other. <laughs> and, uh, and Alicia Weinberger did a nice overlay of their two op analyses of the same data, and their two data analyses look somewhat different from each other. So I was thinking about showing that plot to you, but I thought, ah, let's wait a little while and see if this claim for water absorption on this planet is real or not. So these are pretty robust. You don't have to squint not your eyes to say those are real spectra, but if you look in your uh, space.com and various uh, newspaper articles, I'm sure there'll be a lot of hullabaloo about the first detection of water on a super-Earth, and just say, well, We'll see, we'll wait. Astronomers like to debate these things, and I think there'll be a debate about this one. But to start doing spectra, you have to take a picture of it, right? So what can we do from the ground? Well, here is the most, one of the most spectacular images taken. It won uh, Christian Marois and his, his colleagues uh, at the Dominion Observatory in uh, British Columbia, the Cleveland Newcomb Prize for the best paper in science this year. They're looking at a, a bright star, an A5 star, fairly massive, and they found evidence for three planets around it. And this was done by very carefully blotting out the starlight by something called a chronograph, where you put your, essentially your thumb over the starlight, 
try and block the starlight and see what else is around there. And the spectacular thing about it is there's actually not just three planets there. All these little speckles here is a planet too. This is so-called speckles. This is the, st the stuff that's left out over if you're trying to cancel out the starlight. It's really hard to do it. Uh, but if the folks put together a montage of all of the images that have been taken, and it came up with this incredible first ever movie of the planets in another planetary system orbiting around their star. And you can see here's that extra speckle, turns out. The speckle should pretty much stay put because they're due, due to the optics of the, of the camera. But the planets will move, and so there it goes. Now these guys are not what we're looking for. These are Jupiters. They're of great interest. And, and they, were easy to, they, were, they were able to be seen from the ground because, first of all, they're kind of massive. They're about 5, 10 Jupiter masses. They're pretty far out. They're out beyond Jupiter's orbit. They're sort of out at Uranus-Neptune distances, which makes them a lot easier to see. Uh, and they were, this, these observations were done with, uh, with the 10-meter Keck telescope on Hawaii and the 8.2-meter uh, Gemini North telescope on, on Mauna Kea also. So uh, in order to do that sort of observation, though, you have to be able to do, like I say, use a chronograph, sort of block out the starlight. And you also have to get rid of, as much as you can, the the bad effects of the Earth's atmosphere, so-called seeing. When you look at a bright star at night, you'll see it twinkle. It's not your eye, hopefully. It really, really means is that uh, the atmosphere is changing, bubbling around, convecting, and that's making the light paths that the light front is coming at you move back and forth, and it makes it appear to twinkle. So you really want to do is create a system which is called adaptive optics, which will take care of that for you. And we actually have in Carnegie an adaptive optics system working right now on one of the Magellan telescopes down in Chile. This shows you one of the Carnegie Magellans, 6.5 meters, which owe their existence to our former Carnegie president in the front row, Maxine Singer, who I think, uh, yes, we should thank Maxine for that. This is something that was done, what, uh, 25 years or so ago, probably when the fundraising was underway for this. And MAGO is functioning right now. Uh, my colleague Alicia Weinberger will be traveling there in a couple of weeks to do an, uh, a MAGO run. And, uh, the nice thing about MAGAO is it uh, allows you to take something which is a blurry picture, blurred by the Earth's atmosphere, turn on AO, and suddenly you can see both members of this binary star system blow it up a little bit, and that's how you'll be able to see an Earth around a nearby star. So that's the thing that has to be done with future space telescopes if we're going to do the search from the ground. What I want to focus on in the next is to tell you that it's a battle going on. There's a battle between the ground and space. You know, NASA wants to do this too. They don't want to, you know, they'd like to get some kudos and send somebody else to Stockholm to shake the king's hand. And on the ground, it's not just uh, the US, it's the US versus our European competitors who are equally, I mean, they've opened up the field, right? Michelle Mayor and Didier Kahlo were Swiss. They wouldn't mind going to Stockholm to shake the, the king's hand. Uh, and even within the US, there are unfortunately groups that are battling them ourselves to build the next big generation telescope. So it's a race. It's a co competitive race. I mean, it's a good competition because we all want the, to reach the same goal and hopefully do it as honorably as possible with the amount of money we have, which is difficult. So here is a montage of all of the telescopes that are existing on the ground. I sort of try to draw a line between those on the left which exist now and those which are being conceived of or built in the future. Uh, James Webb Space Telescope exists, but has not, of course, been launched yet. You can see from this graphic that it was planned to launch quite some time ago. Right now, we're hoping to launch it in March of 2021. Here's little old Kepler. Kepler is a little guy. It's a 1.5 meter primary with a 95 centimeter aperture. Uh, here are the two Magellan telescopes. Uh, and there are grand plans of what there's a European telescope as well as two competing US telescopes. And the question is, which one of them will get to the prize first of trying to detect evidence for life on a nearby, potentially habitable Earth-like planet? So I just have to show you the images of what they look like, because these are artists' conceptions. Needless to say, uh, this, this telescope was nowhere as near this stage of completion. I believe this, this mountain is called Cerro Armazones in the northern Atacama Desert of Chile. It's been leveled. I think they probably are doing some more site work there. This is a really big guy. This is, the, this is the, the mother of all telescopes, as it were. 798 segments. Uh, it has pretty good support from all the European uh, Southern Observatory. A lot of countries have bought into it, and um, it seems to be proceeding along. They have a different way of funding their telescopes there, so their funding is relatively secure compared to 
what is the case for the American competitors. Although uh, uh, I, I think even the, the, the ELT has a problem because they're expecting Brazil to become a major partner. And Brazil, those of you who know what Bolsonaro is doing in Brazil, is doing some terrible things to science, cutting back on federal funding. And so I would think the Brazilian share of this is probably in some danger. And Brazil was not yet a member of ESO, so they're sort of putting in their, their starter fee as well as the additional for buying into this. So Brazil was going to put a couple hundred million dollars into this, so who knows what's going to happen with that. Meanwhile, in the US, Carney has said, hey, we should build our own really big Magellan telescope. So these are now 8.4 meter diameters. The Magellans are 6.5. So these are scaled up now to as big as can be made in the mirror lab and the, underneath the football stadium at the University of Arizona in Tucson, oddly enough. And they have a very unique design here with instead of a whole bunch of little tiny guys like uh, the European telescope has, have six telescopes in a ring here, six primaries, uh, and, then, and one primary in the center. And the really neat thing about this design is each of these um, six ring telescopes is conjugated to a secondary mirror up here, and the ray path for light coming in does not hit any of these supporting arms. It's done by design, and that means you do not have to worry about diffraction from the supports. When you look at a star in the sky, you collect, typically see a picture of a, of a cross in the sky. That cross, unless you've got astigmatism, is not due to your eye, is due to the fact that the telescope which took the picture has, has, has 90 degree mounts on it. You're seeing diffraction from those, those uh, mounts. And needless to say, diffraction is, is one of the bugaboos. You want to get rid of that if you want to see an Earth-like planet. So GMT was designed, bless their, their hearts, to eventually do really great imaging without having to get screwed up by diffraction from the, from the mirrors. Unfortunately, there is no plan yet to build a chronograph for first light. There will be a really great spectrograph built for it as a first light instrument. It will do really fantastic Doppler velocities. Uh, but it's not until we get some more money, perhaps, uh, and, and have the initiative within the institution and the partners. Uh, we don't really have plans on the, on the boards to, to do imaging with this, but this is a tool that's designed from the get-go to be able to do it really, really well. Then the third partner, which is uh, competing, uh, is the 30-meter uh, telescope, which is planned to go on Mauna Kea. You may have also seen some stories uh, in the press that the, once again the Hawaiians are fighting that quite successfully. They blocked the most recent attempt to begin construction. They have a backup site in the Canary Islands on the Roque de los Muchachos, de los Muchachos Observatory, which already has functioning telescopes, including a rather large 10.4 meter Grand Canaries telescope, currently the largest in the world. So the question is where is, they also have some uh, problems with getting enough money for it, but their even bigger problem is where are they going to put the thing? And this problem, we thought we had solved this because this last year, a number of us were involved in trying to get the two US competing visions to work together instead of fighting each other and to try to get money from the National Science Foundation, which is the main way of supporting ground-based astronomy. And so a fair amount of effort was put into trying to put together a workshop and plans to try to get NSF to help support the construction and operation, most importantly, because operational costs can also eat you up. If you, if you want to build a um, $10 billion telescope, which is sort of the area these, these things reside in, the rule of thumb is it costs you 10% a year to run it. So not only you need a uh, billion dollars to build it, you need $100 million a year to keep it going. So as they say, uh, Everett Dirksen used to say when he was in the Senate, you know, a billion here, a billion there, Pretty soon you're talking serious money. <laughs> so the US ELT program, we'll see how long. It's been complicated, as I just said, by this fact that the GMT, by the way, I should say, has a site. We own it, at least for 99 years or so, maybe a little bit longer. Carnegie owns it. The mountain's been cleared off. They blasted it off. I remember seeing blasts go off at noon. We would wait for lunch for the blast to go off. Then we'd go in and have lunch. It was time to, the excitement for the day was over. They're already digging holes. They're, that construction is well along. They've got five of the uh, seven mirrors already built, and uh, several of them have already been figured. So GMT is rolling right along. They're building mirrors for the other two telescopes as well. ELT has a site ready to go. TMT is the one that's a little bit uh, uncertain where it will be. But both of those have been proposed to the most important arbiter of which goes forward, which is something called Astro 2020. The US astronomy community for I think about 
50 years now has been putting together every 10 years a report where they try to sit down and go in a closed room with cigar smoke and everything in the old days and battle with each other to decide what we should all agree on should be funded, should be done next. Rather than have fights all the time over what should be done next, every 10 years they say, here's the list. They hand one list to NSF, one list to NASA, and say, here's what you should do. And to their credit, those funding agencies have, have, have really respected that process. Uh, this, the decadal surveys are, are treated as the Holy Bible by members of Congress and OMB and by the funding agencies. And so this is the big decision point, is whether or not NSF, for example, will be willing to put in maybe a billion dollars to help support these two US ground-based telescopes. But if they do, if we do get the GMT to be built, and I wish our president was here because I'd like to make the pitch to him that we should be working on getting a chronograph for the GMT so that we can take a picture of this thing right here because then someone will get a chance to visit the, the king in Sweden. This is the Alpha Sen system. These two stars here are actually so close together that by eye you cannot separate them. They're actually the third brightest star in, in the sky. Only Sirius Canopus are, are brighter. It's a binary though, and they're actually uh, the closest triple star system to us. And I say triple because there's an addition, a third star, which you cannot see on the scale because it's inside this red dot. But right around there is a little faint red dot. That's Prox Sen B, Proxima Centauri. That is the closest star to us. There's nothing that we know of that's closer. It's basically 4.3 light years away. So if you could travel the speed of light, you'd be there in four years. Not too bad. And it was discovered to have a, by Doppler, an Earth mass planet in the habitable zone, no less, by Guillaume Anglades Goudet, who was a former postdoc of us here. He's perhaps one of our most famous postdocs at this point. At least I hope, hope he will continue to be because he's doing great work. And so this is the candidate that is perfectly placed for GMT because if the TMT goes to Hawaii, this star is to the south. TMT can't see it. <laughs> uh, ELT will be able to see it, unfortunately, so there will be competition. But it's just the right, the distance of the planet away is such that the GMT could resolve it. Here's a disc uh, contrast how bright the object is compared to its star versus how far away it is from the star. Earth's way down in this corner here. These are sort of known planets as well as guesses based on Kepler. And here's where Prox Sen B rests. It's somewhere around 10 million times fainter than its host star, which is a low mass star with a mass about one eighth the mass of the sun. And here's what GMT could do. Because it's 25 meters in diameter, that means it has, it's large enough that it can see so-called lambda over d, the resolution power, is small enough that it can see down to these distances and it could actually measure prox Sen b as it goes around and around its star. And if it really turns out to have these signs of habitability, that could very well be the first conclusive demonstration of a nearby habitable and potentially inhabited world. Okay, so that's a challenge to the GMT folks to someday raise enough money to build a chronograph. Uh, meanwhile, NASA is not giving up. It has a number of missions that are going forward. Uh, Hubble and Spitzer have been of great value for studying extra, extrasolar planets, even though they were not really built to do it. They just happened to be around. They're general purpose telescopes. They've done great work. Kepler was the first telescope ever built by NASA specific, specifically to do exoplanets. And you know, that was only launched in 2009. I've been working with NASA since 1988 trying to plan a space telescope. It took us, what, uh, quite a bit longer than that, two decades to finally get Kepler up. And then their tests, which I'll tell you about in a moment, has been launched, and the future in call involves James Webb Space Telescope and WFIRST, which I'll step through in a moment. So the most exciting telescope working right now, by the way, the Kepler K2 mission has been shut down. They ran out of fuel, so that one truly is slowly drifting away from the Earth and in an orbit around the sun. But back in April 2018, TESS was launched, which is basically done to just do the same thing as Kepler, stare at places in the sky, but not just stare at one place over and over uh, for this, all the time, but to actually do a loop over the entire sky, sort of do an orange peel around the sky and look only for really bright targets, really bright stars, because Kepler was limited in staring at one area, and so anything it found could be close by or could be really far away, and they're often quite faint. This is actually a quite small telescope. 
these cameras are only four inches in diameter. They're little guys, cost is low, but they've got a very wide field of view. Each one of these cameras has a 24 degree by 24 degree field of view, so that's times four, whereas Kepler is only doing 10 degrees by 10 degrees. So it'll be looking at many more stars, but it's only gonna bother looking at the brightest stars, which means they're the closest ones. So the whole point is to find the close by Earths and super Earths. And once TESS has its target list, it's already found a couple of dozen, including a few super Earths. There are some really in intriguing discoveries by TESS already. But the point is that those discoveries will then be fed to the James Webb Space Telescope, which hopefully will launch in 2021. Well, there have been some rumors lately in press releases when Northrop Grumman, who's building it, and NASA headquarters talks about it. They say, instead of saying it's scheduled for launch in March of 2021, they simply say scheduled for launch in 2021. I don't think they drop March by accident. So December 2021? Anyway, uh, that's a $9.7 billion space telescope. It again was not designed to do exoplanets. It's designed to do faint galaxies, which is wonderful stuff. But in the, in the meantime, exoplanets have come along. And what JWST will do, though, is look at some of those transiting targets that, that, uh, that TESS will find. And it can only really do transiting systems because it doesn't have a chronograph of the type that you really need to find Earth-like planets. It can only measure objects nearby that are maybe 100,000 times fainter than the star. It can't go down to the 10 to the 10 times level you need to get to an Earth. So, it's not going to do direct imaging, but what it can do is start, stare at a star when the planet goes in front of it and see what happens to the atmosphere of the, of the, of the, of the, light, the light coming from the star as it passes through the planet's atmosphere and tell you something about the atmosphere comp composition. So besides the test targets, uh, it's also going to be for sure looking at this rather amazing system, TRAPPIST-1. This was found initially from, again, some ground-based telescopes, but then it was added on to with some really wonderful transit data taken by Spitzer. And the fantastic thing about this is this is a low-mass nearby star. It's, out of, it's about 10 times farther away than Proxen B is. Uh, it's about, instead of four light years, it's about 41 light years away. And the star stellar mass is a little bit lower. It's about 1 12th the mass of the sun. But it has these at least seven planets all in a flat plane, all aligned with our point of view. There probably could be other planets in there, other, other angles, or there could be one farther out that we haven't seen yet. But that is truly amazing. Seven of them all in a flat plane. Truly, you know, no theorist would have predicted that. You know, if we, we you know, would say, you're crazy. You know, uh, yeah. But it's real. It's observable. And a couple of them are, they're so close in, the habitable zone is in quite close because this is a low mass star, so you have to get pretty close to have uh, liquid water. There are two or three of them that are considered to be habitable, and they all transit, so James Webb Space Telescope will be studying those for sure. Okay, those are transiting planets. That's great. But transiting planets, you, know, you have to have a really nice, perfect orbital alignment to see them transit. Whereas all the other, now I just told you every star has planets, right? So what about all the other ones that aren't aligned so that we, their orbits are, are uh, edge on to us? We want to be able to just do genuine direct imaging. So NASA's first competitor there is going to be something called the WFIRST Space Telescope, which uh, was, uh, was, pre which was um, put forward by the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey, which I happen to be a member of. Uh, and uh, the amazing thing that helped this thing go forward is that it's using these leftover optics that the National Reconnaissance Office had constructed to do Earth spying. They're Hubble size, Hubble quality, but very wide field of view. And they'd been sitting in a cold storage room in upstate New York for about 10 years, and someone finally said, well, let's get rid of them. And they asked somebody at NASA, hey, would you like some really nice Hubble quality optics? And NASA thought about it for a while and then said, yeah. So uh, I was part of a, a workshop up at Princeton where we just talked about what to do with them. And uh, there are actually uh, two complete sets of, of optics and a few spares. And they, so they actually had two sets to talk about. So they had a competition within NASA saying, what can we do with, uh, you know, we'll use one for W first, but we got another set. What should we do with the other one? And the only constraint that was placed on them was that whatever you do with it, it's not allowed to look down at the Earth. Because that's what they're designed to do. So that's why the National Reconnaissance Office said, you can do whatever you want, but don't look at the Earth. Oddly enough, 
But NASA was able to go with those constraints. They decided in the end not to use a second set of optics, but they do have the one set which is going to work perfectly fine. And WFIRST will do some wonderful things about dark energy, but more importantly, it will do a really great so-called gravitational microlensing survey, which is another sort of indirect way of finding planets. And this is based on the fact that Albert Einstein postulated back in the 19, 1930s. He didn't think it would ever be able to be observed, but he said, you know, theoretically it's possible. But here's a case where a theoretician actually made a correct prediction that turned out to be spectacularly correct. What Einstein said was, suppose you're sitting here on Earth with a telescope looking at a background star, and there's some stars in the foreground. And if this foreground star happens to pass right along a direct line of sight between you and that background star, the foreground star's gravity bends space-time, which means the light waves, which don't really have mass, but they're bent by space-time, are bent around the foreground star, and, you, and so you might get extra light rays coming into your telescope, which means that that foreground star that you're, uh, which you don't even see, you're looking at the background star, the background star suddenly gets bright for a month and then dims again. And it never, never happens again unless another star happens to come, come in front of you. So it's like a one-time brightening and dimming with no other explanation except something must have cast in front. And if the foreground star has a planet in it too, uh, especially if it's out at what's called the Einstein radius, which is basically the asteroid belt in our solar system, then you'll get on top of that month-long brightening and dimming, you'll get a spike of intensity, even brighter light, for a couple days. It's been, microlensing has been able to, uh, to detect several dozens of planets using ground-based telescopes. One of the most important ones is actually at Carnegie's Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. And uh, what WFIRST will do, though, is something very complementary to what Kepler did. Kepler was primarily used for short period orbits, because you want to see multiple trans in order to make sure you really believe what's happening. If you only see a single trans, you don't know what the orbital period, you're not sure if it's real, if it's just noise. So you only, and it only lasted for four years, and so you're sort of restricted to things inside of the Earth, uh, Earth-Sun distance, 1AU. But W first is sensitive to this microlensing and sensitive to this Einstein radius, asteroid belt, so it's actually, we'll be able to see things farther out. So it'll, it's going to help us complete the planetary demographics, the census of what's out there. So that'll be interesting for those of us who are theorists. For example, I've got a paper I just uh, submitted, uh, got accepted this week, where I'm saying, hey, you know, it looks like there, it's not that hard to make gas giant planets out at distances where W first should find them. So uh, a theorist is once again trying to make a prediction in spite of the horrible history of theorists. We'll see in another 10 years if, it's, if I'm right or wrong. But even more exciting from my point of view is that W first has added on to it a coronagraph. For the first time, NASA's planning on flying in space a coronagraph. This shows you one of the test beds that they use to, uh, to work on the technology for really refining in great and gory detail how to put a really fancy little piece of, of metal in front of the, of the star and block it out and catch all the light and get rid of the diffraction and all the mess that comes from having the rather peculiar optical shape of the, of the w first telescope, which unfortunately has a has those spiders on it, because it was built just to look at the Earth. They didn't care about the diffraction stuff. So it's got spiders, so it's got messy optics. So the chronograph has to be pretty, pretty technically uh, sweet. This is inside one of the thermal vacuum test beds out at JPL. I actually spent most of the day preparing for the review next week at JPL of the chronograph instrument for WFIRST, because it turns out I'm the chair of the independent review team that rules on whether or not they are ready to move into so-called phase C. So it's amazing. I just went, you know, I went through 700 pages of PowerPoint presentations. So if I'm staggering today, it's because of, uh, I'm getting ready for what's going to happen next week at JPL. So what that chronograph will do is it's really only going to be a technology demonstrator because money is tight. So they've cut back its technical specs. But should still be able to find things in this region here. It should be able to find contrast ratios of somewhere around 10 to the minus 8 is sort of required to do that. That's its lowest level requirement. But there's a good chance it'll get down to 10 to the minus 9. But it's a small telescope. It's only 2.4 meters, just the same size as Hubble. So it's, it's not going to, you know, GMT is 10 times bigger. It's going to go 10 times closer in. So it will not be able to do Prox NB. Prox NB is too close to its star for, for W first to take an image of it. But there are going to be a lot of other planets nearby there. It's really intended primarily, as I said, as a technology demonstrator. They just want to make sure that all the, the various optical elements work in space. And then we'll be ready for something really grand and expensive.
but first we need money. So here's the other big question is what's going to happen with W first, first of all, because President Trump has two years in a row zeroed out funding for W first. Said, ah, we don't need it. JWST costs too much. Who needs it? So, uh, but Congress says, no, we need it. So Congress has put it back in two years in a row. We're still waiting to see what happens for FY2020. We hope Congress will put it in again. This slide is a couple years old, as you can see. Uh, I've not been able to find a more recent one, but it probably has not changed very much from this. But the hope is that once James Webb launches, which is now perhaps 2021, the amount of money that's being spent on Webb will drop away so that it opens up a new funding wedge to, to, uh, to continue building W first, and then in the future, build something else that will be the subject of Astro 2020. That will be the next decade, the next plans for the future. So it all, it all comes down to money. And, um, and by and large, Congress has treated NASA pretty well, I think. We can't complain. Uh, we, we use the money wisely, and we've done some fantastic things, not only in astrophysics, but of course in planetary science. Andrew Steele gave a wonderful talk today about looking for life on Mars. And that's the other really promising way to try to find life outside the Earth. OK, so it all comes back to Astro 2020. They will also be worrying about not only NSF, ground-based observatories, but also what will fly in space. And NASA has been planning for Astro 2020 for some time. They've been thinking ahead. Let's start planning what the best, most likely mission concepts should be that should be studied. And they put a fair amount of money into studying these four concepts, the Habitable, Planet Exo, uh, Exo, Habitable Exoplanet uh, uh, Telescope, the Large UV Optical Infrared Telescope, which is this large one here, Lynx, which is an X-ray observatory, and then the Origin Space Telescope, which is a mid-infrared. I've highlighted Habax and Louvoir because those are the two that will be able to do direct imaging of nearby Earths. Origins will do some interesting work on, on planets, but it'll be more transiting planets, sort of like what James Webb Space Telescope does. There's also, interestingly enough, some money put into so-called $1 billion or less probe missions. One of them is uh, run by our former DTM staff member, Sarah Sager. She's up at uh, MIT now, but she's become a real proponent of flying star shades like this. So share her proposal here is to perhaps develop a star shade which would fly along with W first. Assuming W first survives Congress this year, uh, then maybe for a billion dollars you could add a star shade to fly along and do even more incredible science. You turn W first chronograph from being a technology de uh, demonstrator into with a star shade, it'll find habitable worlds. OK, and just a couple of weeks ago, the final reports for these studies were released. And unfortunately, this is where it gets staggering because they released the costs. And remember, you know, James Webb is 9.7 billion or so. It's not off the ground yet. And that, that was considered pretty pricey. Depending on how you do the bookkeeping for Hubble, if you take into account the, the servicing missions and the true cost of flying shuttle, you know, Hubble maybe cost $20 billion, but it's, it's, I think it's paid for itself over the years. It's done fantastic science. We do get to see if James Webb will pay us back the $9.7 billion. These folks just kind of went crazy. Uh, you know, that's not for attribution. I, I will deny I made that remark. If you are on, no, I'm, I didn't say that because I've been chastised for wandering the halls at NASA headquarters and saying, oh my god, you really think you're going to get that much money after what we know about James <laughs> Webb? So I have been chastised, but I don't listen. That really is a lot of money, especially because the Astrophysics Division Director, Paul Hertz, a short while ago, sort of did that run out on the budget chart. Uh, yeah, this one here, this is the, we used to call that the Blue Lake in the future. When we did Astro 2010, we thought we had a $4 billion blue lake of money to spend. By the time our report came out, the blue lake had dwindled to a, a rivulet of nothing because James Webb Space Telescope did not launch. So when last heard, I think the blue lake for Astro 2020 was roughly $5 billion. And that's probably a conservative upper bound unless Congress started adding more money to the pot. But I think we'd be quite happy if Congress just sort of keeps astrophysics funding more or less where it is, maybe some inflation increases. So these folks are talking about, as Everett Dirksen would say, serious money. <laughs> OK, but they would do fantastic science. Uh, Louvoir, because it's so big, uh, will probably be able to give us spectra of maybe 100 habitable worlds. Habex is a little bit smaller. If it flies to starshade, though, it'll probably do more like dozens which is 
that's appreciable. I mean, if you see only one, the Prox NB, that might be the very first one, but then we're going to want to do more and more. By the time you get a dozen, while well, you're really learning something, if you can do 100, my God, you now have a, you can do enough statistics now. And then it becomes uninteresting. OK, but these images will only be single pixel dots. What we really want, of course, something like that. But even at a 10 pixel image, like this one at the bottom, where you could see oceans and continents, if you watched it, and you'd see them rotate if you took enough pictures. In order to build this guy at, at the visible wavelengths, you'd need two 17 meter diameter telescopes. So 17 meters, that's kind of that's the size of Louvoir, Louvoir A. And not only that, you'd have to have that much of a light bucket, but you also have them 120 kilometers apart and combine them as interferometer. You have to do space interferometry, which is not trivial, to put it mildly. Uh, the uh, gravitational wave folks are planning on doing it with LISA. It's not, not a simple thing to do. So this is something for the distant future. But if you can do that, you will be able to get multi-pixel images of nearby Earth-like planets. OK, so I just want to close by saying, if you really want to know more about this, as Rick hinted, I've written a number of books on this, three of them on the subject of exoplanets. The most recent one was just published earlier this year, Universal Life. Uh, probably the easiest uh, place to find it is on Amazon.com. And if you do so, you'll do something also important, which is you'll help support publication of the Washington Post, which I think we all want to <laughs> keep going for other reasons. So at that point, I think I'll draw to a close and uh, take any questions you have. Rick? You mentioned, I believe, that Proxima Centauri is a triple star system with a, perhaps a planet around one of them. Yes. What do the other two stars, what effect do they have on its orbit? So the, the Alpha Sen system are two binary stars here with about, about 20 times the Earth's on distance separation. And Prox Sen is itself, which is the one that has the Earth-like planet around it, is considerably farther away. So they're thought to be co-moving in space, so they're probably bound, but we don't know enough about their orbits to you know, watch this one go around. What it will be is this, this guy will be the, the one that's the center of mass mostly, and Prox NB will be orbiting around that, but they've not been followed long enough in time to see what the orbit is like. So the, the, two, the binary is not going to affect anything around Prox NB. There are claims in the past that uh, one of the Alpha Sen planets, one of the Alpha Sen stars has a planet. That's not been confirmed. But Alpha Sen is so close by and so bright that you actually don't need a very big telescope to look for planets around Alpha Sen. Uh, there, you really only need like a one meter telescope. So there have been proposals to sort of do a, a low budget te space telescope with only do one star, the Alpha Sen star, and nail it. And uh, so it's still a promising system for other planets. There's probably other planets there, but the only one we know of is Prox Sen B. I'd like to ask your uh, reaction to the argument that uh, John Gribben did in the book Alone in the Universe, that if you look at not the existence of life, but the existence of a technologically advanced uh, uh, civilization, mm -hmm. that the odds of finding something are much, much lower. And in fact, he argued that there, we may in fact be unique in the galaxy in terms of having such a civilization. Well, certainly, I mean, the SETI is a whole other way of uh, making things a lot easier to do and, and get something interesting right away. If you get someone else's television program, that would be quite fascinating to watch. But, um, and, and that's a whole other talk, of course. SETI is very active. But uh, you're, you're right that if we don't find anything, uh, or if we search and don't find anything, that may mean that there's no life there, or it just means we haven't searched hard enough. That's what the SETI folks say. If you hear Jill Tarter give a talk about SETI, she'll point out to you that the analogy is, in terms of the SETI searches which have been done so far, which actually began back on the Howard Tatel Telescope, named after a DTM staff member, back in 1960, of all the bandwidth that's been done by SETI searches so far, it's equivalent to a, to a glass of water out of all the oceans of the Earth. So it's like if you said, I, I picked up a glass of water out of the Pacific, and gee, I didn't see any sharks in there, so I guess there aren't any sharks. <laughs> you didn't really make up a point. But, but what I didn't really emphasize is, of course, that multicellular life has only really been on Earth for 500 million years or so. We have maybe two, three, three and a half million years of uh, single cell life. 
And so if you're just using that factor there of maybe 10% of the time it's multicellular, but most of the time it's single cell stuff, if we find life, it's likely to be something like swamp bacteria. I mean, that's, that's the, if you're picking Earth at random times, you're going to find methanogenic bacteria and maybe cyanobacteria. But even that, you know, that would be pretty exciting because we still don't know how to make life like that ourselves, right? We, there are whole sets of people who study the origin of life, and they don't know how to do it. So if you're already, you know, if it's like being in undergraduate school, if you're working on a physics problem, you look in the back of the book and see what the answer is. It's a little bit harder to work it out. So if we find that there's life elsewhere, cyanobacteria, by golly, that'll keep the guys who are trying to, th and guys and gals, I should say, who are trying to make life in the laboratory, they'll say, hey, yeah, it, it didn't just happen here. Same thing for finding uh, life on Mars. We can find life on Mars and find out that the, uh, the, the sugars there are, are are, are, are left-handed and the amino acids are right-handed, the opposite of Earth, and that'll be a case that maybe that life arose independently. So that would be equally exciting. There's one way in the back. Or if you want to just... uh, so the other observation there is that there's been detectable signals of life in Earth's atmosphere for two and a half billion years, which is more than half of Earth history. And we've only been broadcasting I Love Lucy for 50 years. So, <laughs> so technological life and, and signatures of life are different things. I have read, and I don't remember where, that in order for life actually to survive on Earth, it's very important that we have a magnetic core in the Earth to protect us. Uh, the, mag the magnetic field protects us from all the incoming bad stuff from the sun that would otherwise devastate us all. I wonder if there's any way you can tell on these exoplanets whether there is a magnetic field around them or not, because I think that would go a long way toward assessing whether life was possible. That's an excellent point. Knowing whether or not an exoplanet has a magnetic field if it's a terrestrial type planet is, is, could very well be an important ingredient for maintaining life as well as perhaps having it evolve in the first place. There are other criteria you could throw on top, like maybe they should have plate tectonics along with having a, mm -hmm. have a carbon cycle. Uh, but the question is, we're having such a hard time just figuring out what might be in the atmosphere of these worlds. We have, and we have to find them first, and then we're going to worry about the atmospheres. It's, at the moment, I don't think anyone has a plausible means for saying anything definitive about the exoplanet magnetic fields on an Earth-like planet. What people can do is on some of those hot Jupiters where they're in very close to the star, and Jupiter has a magnetic field. Um, Jupiter has, uh, in fact, Jupiter was discovered by accident by a DTM staff member in 1955, Bernie Burke, who was running a radio survey out in Poolsville, Maryland, and he noticed something was making noise in the sky. And different place in the sky every night, so it must be astronomical. It turns out that he was look, he discovered Jupiter's decametric radio ob ob emission. So we know the uh, close-in hot Jupiter is going to have magnetic interactions with the, with the star. So certainly magnetic fields are going to be on these other worlds, but it's a little bit hard right now to imagine how we'll be able to say that about a, an Earth-like habitable world. It'd be a wonderful thing to be able to do. If you got any ideas, let me know. <laughs> I have a second question, too. I was fascinated by that planet that was apparently rotating around its star in a matter of hours. Is that uh, what, is that I read that yeah, right? Yes, the very hot, the very hottest period Jupiters, some of them have orbital periods of just a few hours. They're now, does that really mean close. they're very close to the star? Or very exactly, yes. No, they're very close, right. I didn't, didn't point that out, but some I mean, of them are basically within be? like one stellar radius away. And in fact, there's evidence now that um, the hot Jupiters don't last forever. Because it turns out the very shortest period hot Jupiters are only seen around stars that are younger than 2 billion years. By the time the star gets to be 4, 5, 6 billion years old and the hot Jupiters are no longer there, where'd they go? Well, the star must have eaten them. So somehow some tidal decay uh, must have lost them inside. Of course, also, the hot Jupiters are in danger for when the star goes through its stellar evolution and becomes a giant. It's going to swell out, eat them also. Of course, that's our fate too. So we shouldn't be, uh, you know, not just hot Jupiters, but you know, when our sun expands to be a red giant with basically the radius of Earth's orbit, uh, we might be looking for property elsewhere. You mentioned interferometry, and I'm wondering if there is a, a promise in having more smaller missions in space rather than large, expensive ones. Well, um, the first interferometer that NASA was really serious about flying was something called the Space Interferometry Mission, called SIM. 
And that would have been rather, rather inexpensive. It was only going to be like $1.6 billion. And it was because it was a very clever idea, just two flat mirrors on the end of a 10-meter boom. So it gave you the resolving power of a 10-meter telescope and interferometry combined with a central um, instrument bay. And uh, that would not have imaged Earth's although there were plans earlier on to make the siderostats movable so you could do a, a, a mapping eventually. But it would be able to measure the wobble of a star down to being able to see the wobble caused by an Earth mass planet. Remember I told you that Jupiter makes the sun wobble back and forth over its diameter? The Earth makes the, the uh, sun wobble also, but it makes it a wobble 1,500 times smaller. So makes it a lot harder. Instead of looking for what's called milliarc second wobbles, you're looking for microarc second wobbles. But SIM was designed to do that. I was on the Astro 2010 Decadal Survey. I was pushing for SIM because I'd been working for on it indirectly for many years. It got shot down because they wanted to do W first. And uh, $1.6 billion was considered too much, even though NASA had already spent $600 million developing it. So there's, you know, who knows what will happen. Right now, no one's proposing that for Astro 2020. But eventually, interferometry will come back. The Europeans have been very enthusiastic about it. Uh, they're the ones who are pushing for the LISA gravitational wave uh, de uh, detector, which is, again, sort of small telescopes, but interferometry. And so once that concept gets proven, perhaps by gravitational wave detectors, then maybe we'll be back to doing optical interferometry, interferometry to do imaging of exoworld. So it's, it's a good point. Last question or two. A uh, quick question on the wobble effect. Uh, you, you mentioned that the Jupiter will uh, make the sun wobble around the mm -hmm. center. But in the Earth, uh, we have, um, I guess, nine planets. So how, uh, and, and, and around the sun, system, you might have more, 10, 15, whatever. How can you separate the impact of each star, each uh, planet, in that one wobble around the center? That's an excellent point. It, it's a real mess for data analysis. You can imagine, yes. You've got all those wobbles all over the place. And they've already done that with the radial velocity folks. They've, you know, I showed you the, the transit data where they found seven objects around Trappist. That was pretty messy in the first place, trying to figure out which transit matches which one here, which one is the same planet. But if you have enough data and enough computer power, you can find the best fit to it. I think the Doppler folks have been able to find up to maybe, maybe four or five wobbles that they think they can separate in cleanly. But what they basically usually do is kind of take the biggest wobble out, throw that away, separate that off, and then look for the next biggest one, and work their way through. But that's not necessarily always the best way to do it. In fact, there's an ongoing battle about whether or not my colleague Paul Butler found a habitable zone planted around the star called Gliese 581 because of two different ways of analyzing the data. The Europeans did it one way. Paul Butler and his colleagues did it another way, and Paul Butler sees planets the Europeans don't see. So when you get to trying to find multiple planets in the same system, it gets to the point of scientists arguing with each other. Uh, so it, it, it gets messy fast, yes. Uh, but that's one, again, nice thing about direct imaging, by golly. If you see something there, there it is. Follow it long enough, you'll have an orbit. You're clearly using a lot of advanced mathematical models and brand new sensing tools uh, and, and modeling types. Is any of that being fed back into you know, more earthbound projects, programs? No, I think we are more leeches on the body than we are uh, giving thing. Uh, I mean, like adaptive optics was developed not by astronomers, it was developed by Defense Department folks looking for tracking satellites and orbits. Uh, and a lot of the uh, technology we use um, comes from the dark side. I mean, like those NRO telescopes, uh, those were things we weren't supposed to know about. So uh, the things that we're doing are, are not really practical for Earth applications that I know of. We don't generate things like Tang or something like that that the astronauts <laughs> like to eat. Uh, it's really pretty specialized. But I don't think that means the investment isn't worthwhile because we're creating a product that uh, you know, is pretty unique. So it, it's not, I would not sell this product because of uh, we're developing technology uh, for some other use. But what it does do is provide um, hope and experience to a lot of the young people. 
If you go to an exoplanet meeting, I was one up at University of Delaware last week with 80 people, most of whom I did not know because they're all young people. And I mean, I by far was the oldest person in the room. I was sort of sitting around like, oh my God, where am I? Have I been transported in time or something? No, I just am still doing it and a whole flock of young people are coming in. So it's really promising from the point of view of uh, uh, motivating people to, science, to study science and technology and mathematics. Uh, that's, I think, the, that's the best feed off I can think of besides the fact that we want to take a picture of an Earth. You had your hand up for a while here. <clears throat> Thank you. I don't know if this question's been asked already, but uh, how do, uh, in, in the face of the Fermi paradox, what are the chances of us succeeding to find life on, a, on an exoplanet? Uh, well, um, in my book I talk about there's a bet underway at NASA headquarters where Jim Green, who used to be head of the Planetary Science Division at NASA, He's now the chief scientist of NASA, I believe. He, he made a bet with Paul Hertz, head of astrophysics, as to whether Jim Green would find life on Mars before Paul Hertz found life on an exoplanet. So somewhere there's a, you know, there's a bet uh, still active, I think. Um, in fact, uh, on Easter morning in 1996, right after the first couple planets were found, I did a television show. Um, remember John McLaughlin, one-on-one -on -one show long ago? Uh, he did a show with me and, um, and Ed Weiler, who was at the time running astrophysics division at NASA at the time. And at the end, John McLaughlin says, Perfect. well, boss, what do you think the chances of finding life are? I say, oh, 100% we're going to find it. Ed Weiler was more cautious, says, oh, probably only 1%. I remember vividly after the red li the lights went off and we got off the stage, Ed Weiler says, oh, my God, what did I say? What did I say? I said only 1%. Oh, my God, I'm in trouble. Because you just don't, if you're going to be a positive, upbeat NASA person, you don't say 1%. <laughs> you go crazy like, oh, we say 100%. We're going to find it, you know. So um, anyway, uh, I think it's only a question of when. It's not a question of will we find it. I, I really think that if you have one habitable world for every star in the, in the, in the galaxy, and you multiply that by the number of galaxies, there's got to be life somewhere. I, I really doubt that uh, we are a one-time only experiment. Even if it's a low probability event, you multiply that by 10 to the 11th, you get a finite number. So I think life is there. It's just a question of can we, how can we find it and when, what will it take? Will we have to build, uh, I mean, the same thing with uh, looking for life on Mars. Uh, we, there's a good chance there could be something there creating that methane uh, sources that we see. Uh, it's just a question of putting the time and the effort into to, uh, discovering it and proving it, and, and, and especially the arguing that are going to be done. Because when someone makes a claim, just like the Allen Hills 84001 claim for life on Mars, folks are still arguing about that. That was part of the uh, content of our seminar this morning, was uh, that uh, Allen Hills 84001 is wonderful science because it gives us something to argue about and perfect our techniques. Same thing for looking for life on extrasolar planets. Uh, I mentioned earlier there was this claim in, in the news for uh, K218b having water. And I said, well, two different papers came up with slightly different analyses. And so, uh, as I hinted, we're going to be arguing about just whether or not that water is there, much less its implications for life. So um, that should be viewed as part of the process of eventually getting to the point where we can say, yeah, as a consensus, as scientists working together, yeah, you know, this one has life. So please join us again on October 3rd for a different type of imaging. Uh, this is one that you you've know much about, but uh, you'll see a different application of it. It's, well, I'm, I'm about used its, its true name, nuclear magnetic resonances, meaning MRI because they cut the nuclear out because you're not supposed to know that it's nuclear, uh, but it is. Uh, but it, it'll be on uh, the magic of magnetic resonance, uh, which is being given by George Cody, a staff scientist in the Geophysical Lab, the other uh, department on campus. So thank you all very much for coming tonight.